Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Erin Jeanette, and I'll be serving as your online chaplain today. I'll be with you in the chat, both on Zoom and on Facebook. A warm welcome to all of you, especially if you're visiting with us today, either in church or online. We're eager to greet you and learn about how God is at work in your life, so stay tuned. We'll say more about that later in the service. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, take a breath. Let yourself rest here in God's presence. Come. Let us worship God together. This is the day the Creator has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Michael's. A reading from the book of Exodus. The whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. In the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there, was, there on the surface of the wilderness was a flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord.
A reading from a letter from Paul to the Philippians. To me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you this privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. 
when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. I invite our kids to join this procession as we go forward for their blessing. Here comes some more. There we are. <laughs> Be blessed as you go forth in wonder and learn more about the amazing generosity of God's love. Amen. And the rest of you may be seated. <clears throat> so we're coming to the end of this special creation season that we've been honoring this year, timed to fall during the harvest season and wind up with the Feast of St. Francis, who has become sort of the patron saint of creation. We're offering prayers that bring the climate and creation to mind, offering our confession for how we have wasted it and not cared for it as God's stewards. Last week, a few of us joined the Climate March here in New York. Out at our cemetery in Queens, we've been installing solar panels that's that are going to produce all the electricity we need out there. Here in our renovations, we've been looking for ways to make these buildings more energy efficient. We're looking together at a possible small group program that digs into these issues of creation and the climate crisis. All these different ways to bring home the point that seems like it should be so obvious, we are called to be better stewards of creation. But it's a point that all too often we don't really think about unless we have to, which the extremes now of weather and drought and disaster are finally forcing the world to do. We avoid it partly because it just seems so vast it's hard to get our heads around it. But I think we also avoid it because it's, it requires such a huge change of mindset for us. And there's something about it that is not fair. Some of us need to change our behaviors more than others of us on this planet if we're going to save this world. And some of us are dealing with the consequences of not changing more than others of us on this planet. There's something in the whole thing that is deeply unfair. And we really don't like it when things are not fair. I remember when my kids were younger, one of the last things I had to do before setting dinner on the table was to get out those two little plastic cups and the milk and pour the milk into the cups. And then I would crouch down so that my eye was at the level of the cups and make sure that there was an equal amount of milk in each cup. I knew this was ridiculous, but I also knew that if I didn't check, somebody else would. Two somebody else's, actually. It had to be even. We have this 
thing about wanting things to be exactly even, certainly when we're kids, but really not just when we're kids. At Saturday Kitchen yesterday, people standing in the rain and waiting for the wonderful food, there was a lot of upset when it seemed like somebody was jumping the line ahead of somebody else. We don't like it when somebody is getting ahead of us or is getting more than us in the system. We don't like it when there's that inequality. And that's why we are always talking about justice and how to pursue it. And we usually think of justice in these terms of fairness. You can think of sort of the figure of justice, you know, the woman in her toga, and she's holding the scales, balancing out exactly. Justice measures and calculates to be sure that it's even, that everybody is receiving their share. So we make laws and we try to arrange our systems so that there is equal opportunity, equal compensation, equal rights. And when that measure is out of balance, when someone is not getting their due, then that is what can lead to rebellion, revolution, upheaval, even war. Seeking justice matters for everyone, for the common good. But often, the justice that we're interested in is not really for the common good so much as justice for me. <laughs> did I get the same amount of milk as he did? Even better, did I get more? We clamor like Sally in A Charlie Brown Christmas. All I want is my fair share. All I want is what I got coming to me. A lot of our laws and systems are really to this end, that I and my people get what's coming to us. Never mind about you. Well, we're confronted with this in today's parable from Jesus where this idea of justice as fairness is kind of thrown out the window. Or, to be more accurate, where our sense of justice is expanded into something bigger. Generosity and grace, reckless, radical gift. It's so wonderful, it's hard to take in. So for most of us, I think our first reaction when we hear this story is not, wow, what generosity. It's to think, that's not fair. Now, for all the times that parables can be obscure and confusing, this one, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, seems to be pretty clear in its point. There's a lot of work to be done in the vineyard, and so throughout the course of the day, the owner goes out to the marketplace and hires more workers in several shifts. And the last ones are hired so late that they work only one hour of the whole day. Who knows why they're only hired at the end? Have they really been standing there all day and overlooked? Maybe they are the ones that nobody wanted for the team? Or did they just appear later? We don't know. But in the end, all the workers, the one hour shift and the 10 hour shift, they all get the same wage. And the ones who worked all day complain. And so do we. It isn't fair, which is Jesus' point. God does what God likes with the abundance on offer. God's generosity is greater than our sense of justice. Everyone gets enough. That's what God's intention is. Nearly 200 years ago, the French political theorist Alexis de Tocqueville made a study of the French and American revolutions, both of those, of course, being stories of greater individual liberty instead of the tyranny that people were living under. But de Tocqueville noted these revolutions resulted also in individuals being more separate from one another, less connected. And he wrote, in a community in which the ties of family, of class, of fraternities no longer exist, people are far too much disposed to think exclusively of their own interests, to become self-seekers, practicing a narrow individualism 
and caring nothing for the public good. And then he goes on, since in such communities nothing is stable, each is haunted by a fear of sinking to a lower social level, and so is feverishly intent on making money or on keeping his wealth intact. I remember reading this in my undergrad class in the early 90s and having one of those moments where you think, man, these old guys, sometimes they actually speak to our time. <laughs> and it's still stuck with me all these years later. It says quite succinctly what we're up against as we deal with these vast problems like the climate crisis or immigration or the economy, the inequality that our system is rife with. No one is willing to let go of today's profits for tomorrow's children, let alone welcome in immigrants and refugees to a system where we fear there isn't enough, let alone change our consumption patterns so that we can produce and waste less stuff. Self-seekers practicing a narrow individualism and caring nothing for the public good, feverishly holding on to their wealth. Now there's, of course, words coming from a political theorist about this, and there's all kinds of theories about the kinds of structures and economies that we need in order to balance this in human nature. But as Christians, I think part of us at least thinks well, right, no, duh. This is actually the expression of human sin. This is part of what is in the nature of human beings, that when things are unstable, something makes people grab for what's theirs. When things feel like we're powerless, we turn on one another. There's not just that within us, in our nature. We are also able to do good, heroic, altruistic things, but this other stuff comes out quite a lot. We don't trust the abundance, and so we ourselves create the scarcity so that there isn't enough, and so that some of us are oppressed because we've opted not to care for the common good. And we see this on every level, from UN meetings to how people treat each other on the street. Me and mine not you. So it is essential for us in human dealings to focus on that fairness, that justice. We balance and we measure and we calculate to prevent injustice, to prevent people from being taken advantage of and exploited. We can't just sit back and say, it'll all work out someday. We have to work at it. We have to set limits on our own consumption, so some of us don't gobble up what others need, to rein in corporations, to curb our own worst impulses so we don't just fall into lawlessness. We can't really run our vineyards like the one in the parable. At least, we don't think we can. But God's generosity keeps going beyond this. It doesn't stop to add things up. It's a reckless generosity rooted in abundance. Jesus tells this parable, I think, to remind people of where their lives come from. You are provided for, he's saying. The owner of the vineyard is generous, and you will have enough. Remember the manna in the wilderness so long ago? The Israelites didn't have to do anything to earn it. That mysterious bread of angels, it just came every day in enough quantity that they could eat and be satisfied. They didn't have to measure it to see if their neighbor got more than them. They just ate what they needed and it was enough. Kind of like it was in the garden 
at the very beginning. We don't have to be so anxious about this. The owner of the vineyard asks the disgruntled laborers, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? And he chooses to give enough so that each one can go home and feed his family, no matter what labor they did that day. He chooses to give to each one, to care for each and all together. Rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. It's not a fair way of dealing. It refuses to calculate and to balance. But instead, the owner gives his money the way we have been commanded to give our love freely to all of our neighbors, caring for all of us on this planet, trusting that there is enough to go around. It isn't fair, but the generosity that God keeps nudging us into, urging us to grow into, the generosity of our money, ourselves, the resources of our planet, is what we're called to. It's care for the common good that prompts us to say no to our narrow selves in favor of the greater whole, to give extra grace to those we meet, to assume good intentions and act as if there really is enough to go around, to do this in our everyday lives, to do this in our voting, to do this in our giving. It's a generosity that doesn't make economic sense. But in God's world, it makes all the sense. And ultimately, we believe this is God's world. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, and together let us profess the Church's faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate in the Virgin Mary, who was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Carmel McCobry. Please join me in the prayers of the people. Creator of earth, sea, and sky, kindle the fire of your spirit within us that we may be bold to heal and defend the earth, 
and pour your blessing upon all who work for the good of the planet. God, giver of life, hear our prayer. Breath of life, receive our thanks for the beauty of our local habitat and all who dwell in it, and grant us the wisdom and will to conserve it. God, giver of life, hear our prayer. Author of the Book of Nature, receive our gratitude for places of restoration and healing, and continue to bless those places that feed our lives and spirits. God, giver of life, hear our prayer. Giver of all good things, awaken us daily to our dependence upon your bounty and make us always thankful for the abundance of your blessings. We give thanks especially for the blessing of our interfaith partnerships and pray for our Jewish neighbors as they celebrate their high holidays. God, giver of life, hear our prayer. Divine physician, heal our communities, especially those where neglect, greed, or violence inflict suffering upon people and other creatures. We pray for the Armenians living in Artsakh as they suffer a campaign of ethnic cleansing. God, giver of life, hear our prayer. Comforter of all the earth, sustain the people of this congregation who desire or need your presence and help, including Kathleen and family, John and family, Vivian, Pete, Esau, Elizabeth, Vargason and family, Patty, Pam, and Aaron. God, giver of life, hear our prayer. Rock and refuge of all your creatures, receive into everlasting mercy all those who have died, including Tony Rodriguez, Amy Miller, Barbara Toner, and Sonia Waters. God, giver of life, Hear our prayer. Bountiful God, you call us to labor with you in tending the earth. Where we lack love, open our hearts to the world. Where we waste, give us discipline to conserve. Where we neglect, awaken our minds and wills to insight and care. May we, with all your creatures, honor and serve you in all things. For you live and reign with Christ, Redeemer of all and with your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Holy and merciful God, we confess that we have failed to honor you by rightly claiming our kinship with all your creatures. We have walked heavily on your earth overused and wasted its resources, taken for granted its beauty and abundance, and treated its inhabitants unjustly, holding future generations hostage to our greed. Have mercy on us and forgive us our sin. Renew in us the resolve to keep and conserve your earth as you desire and intend, with grateful and compassionate hearts, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
Peace with yourself, peace with creation, peace with one another. The peace of Christ be always with you. Love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice for all.
God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Praise and thanks are yours, our creating God. From the dust of the earth, you shaped human beings in your own image. And you filled the earth and seas and skies with a myriad of wonders. Yet we consistently turn your generosity into our scarcity, your elegance into our meanness, and your simplicity into our corruption. Though we poison and destroy your good creation, you continue to offer us your abundance. In your mercy, you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus, transforming death into life. Through the Spirit, you continue to call us into covenant with you for the restoration of creation and the reconciliation of all people. And so we give you thanks, rejoicing with all of creation as we join the saints and angels in their unending hymn. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks to God. He broke the bread, gave it to his friends, and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the wine and gave thanks to God, Creator, and he gave it to his friends, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for all creation for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of the wine, do this in remembrance of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ Christ is risen. risen. Christ will come again. Merciful God, we come to this table seeking reconciliation with you, with one another, and with all creation. Through these mysteries, reconcile us to our world and empower us to restore your creation and fulfill your will. Send your life-giving spirit upon us and upon this bread and wine. Stir in us the creative and redeem the destructive. Heal your stricken world that the soil, the skies, and the seas may be filled with your life anew. Fill every heart with the sure and certain hope that we shall enter into the fullness of your joy when your whole creation is justified by faith and sanctified by love, and you are all in all. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, everlasting God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
Friends, this is God's table, and all are welcome to receive the goodness that comes from it. If you wish to receive healing prayer as well, when you come forward for communion, it is offered at the chapel, side chapel over there. All are welcome. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. On our feet. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And now you can sit back down. We call it gymnastics for Jesus, right? <laughs> you got to keep yourself moving. It's important. Welcome. Good morning. And wonderful, especially, that we're here on this kind of gloomy day that makes some people, I'm sure, feel they'd rather be in bed. But here we are together in worship, so wonderful. If you're joining us today for the first time in person or online, we are so glad that you're here. We'd love to get to know you more. If you are here in person, chat with us at the back of the church before you go out the door. Or if you're online, go to our website and get more information you can do all of that with these QR codes that are in the bulletin and sign up for our email that comes every week that tells you things that are upcoming. Um, there's some time for fellowship and conversation and coffee and all of that at the entrance there. And throughout this fall, we're also having these easel pads with different questions posed on them. Today's answer is a simple check mark. You don't have to write out anything. So just go to the question, see where you are, and just give a check mark to your answer. This is a way of all of us kind of getting to know who we are and what we're getting out of this experience here at St. Michael's. Um, our small groups are beginning this week, so that is kind of the first of the various uh, offerings for this fall for adult formation. And there are still a few spots available for these online groups. They meet Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings. So go online and see if you can get yourself a spot. They'll be studying the books of Micah and Jonah, two prophets with some interesting things to say for our time. Today, after the service, we have a parents' meeting. Mariel. That is true, Kate. We have a parents' meeting. Um, can I invite all the parents to linger briefly um, after service, grab a coffee, and join me in the chapel living room? We're going to have a lively, interactive, time with exciting reveals. <laughs> okay. And next Sunday is our first of our sort of paternal feast days. It is St. Michael's Day. We'll be celebrating it at the 10 o'clock service with all kinds of pomp and joy and excitement. And then at 1 o'clock, we'll be offering a blessing of the animals in honor of St. Francis. So it's kind of a double saint day. So if you have a pet or you'd like to be around pets, come and be part of that. It'll take place in the St. Jude's Chapel there at the entrance, and any creature that is able to be around other creatures well is welcome. So one o'clock, if that creature needs to be there by photo only, that's also possible. So we'll hope to see you for both of those events next Sunday. Okay, let's stand for our final blessing. May the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit, who broods over the world as a mother over her children, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
into creation, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. <laughs> 